Well, thank you very much, Dr. Rump, for uh, inviting me into the class. And thank you, class, for uh, letting me tell you a few things about uh, ethics. This is, despite what Dr. Rump said, I don't in any way claim to be an expert. I'll say more about that. I'm more um, on a journey as a scientist, sometimes doing engineering, uh, just like Dr. Rump and many of us, and just like you, and ethics is something that I think is important. Um, there's some interesting topics in it uh, that can let us do some fun discussion and head scratching. And so I, I'm just kind of journeying down this, this little path that you see there, um, like you, and sometimes thinking about issues that come up related to ethics, whether it's tiny things or not tiny, not, in, not that I mean unimportant, but little things, microscopic issues like copying information, citation, you know, avoiding plagiarism, those things, things I have to do in the job, avoiding conflict of interest and such, um, but also bigger societal issues. So we'll unpack that a little bit and, and talk about, you know, maybe what this journey looks like. And what I'm going to try to do is talk more about frameworks. Hopefully that will become clear as to what I mean. We're gonna talk about ethics and responsible conduct, responsible decision-making. And um, I'll introduce a little bit, but then we'll do a lot of back and forth discussion. Let's see if the slides advance okay. All right, so here's my street cred, uh, as much as there is. I'm interested in science for sure. I'm a chemist who does optical materials. I have um, a joint appointment with the College of Optics in the chemistry department. I train students to do uh, PhDs in chemistry and optics. So, you know, I'm a nerd, I'm a scientist. There's this other half of my brain that really likes things in the humanities. I mean, who doesn't like to see, uh, you know, a good movie or a good piece of art or read a great book? Uh, you know, we all have interest in the, in the humanities and the arts at, at some level. And I remember early on, uh, even before college, but especially in college, those humanities courses I had to take were actually really interesting. Um, and although I did lots and lots of STEM classes, there's always that other side of my brain that's very interested in humanities. And that's kind of a side where philosophy and ethics and things like that happen to live. And so I love this meme. You've probably seen it floating around before. Science can tell you how to clone a Tyrannosaurus Rex. But like the Jurassic Park movie, it's the humanities that can maybe inform us as to why that's not necessarily a good idea. Or more broadly, you know, we can think about our technology. What technology do we generate? What do we do with it? And so on. So, so that's something that I've been interested in for some time. I have a broad interest in the science and the humanities. But I also got to do a couple of different things that um, really made me think more carefully about ethics and responsible conduct. I worked for a little while as an assistant VP for research, filling in for someone who was off at NSF, got to see some interesting things going on in the university, served on some research, misconduct review boards, um, served on a university advisory board in ethics. And that led me to uh, start a project that very broadly is supposed to help people think more about ethics here at UCF and even beyond our borders through activities like this. And I'm working a lot with this guy named Jonathan Beaver. I don't know if you can see my pointer here on my screen, but Dr. Beaver is a proper ethicist. He's a real philosopher. Uh, but he's got a big brain, does a lot of things related to ethics and science. Um, he actually started off studying quantum physics, but decided he really liked the philosophy part more than uh, the science part. Um, so he became a philosopher, but he's very, very competent in the sciences. And so he and I get along real well. And we decided, hey, we need a center for ethics. You know, what's that all about? What's well, just a home and a place for research related to ethics? So I've been doing that kind of thing, along with my uh, research and collaborations with Dr. Rumpf and, and other things. So that's how I've become interested in ethics and responsible conduct. But now I want to know what you think. You guys have studied ethics already. I know you've talked about authorship. I know you've talked about plagiarism and a lot of other things. So now I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to ask you to answer this question. Just kind of shout out, if you will, and we'll do a reveal here on some of these ideas. Let's see if we can populate this. Uh, why should we really care about ethics? And Okay, so it's your turn. Who wants to go?
students. Yeah, you get automatic A in the class if you contribute there. <laughs> yeah, we would like you to. We would like to be collaborative. So go ahead and speak up. So why why do we care about ethics? Or why should you care? <laughs> Were you able to hear that? We don't want our research to be. Okay. Yeah, so that's kind of the first one. You know, aims of research are multifaceted, you know, generate new knowledge and all kinds of stuff, have accurate information out there. Um, so that can't happen unless we're thinking ethically. That's great. What else? I can't be the only one. Come on. Yeah, come on. <laughs> we don't want people to steal our work. We, we don't want people to steal our work we got. All right. I'm going to go with uh, the fifth one then. Promotes moral and social values, right? Fairness. All right. What else? I'll give you a prompt. Who pays for research? It's not the professors. Businesses. Businesses is one that pays for research. Anybody else? Government? Yeah, your, your customer. Yeah. Turns out about 5% of research, fundamental research funded in the United States is actually paid for by businesses. Only 5%. Companies do a lot of research to develop products, but in terms of the basic research, it's only about 5%. Where's that other 95% come from? Government was said. Oh, government was said. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that goes to this one. Uh, basically, you guys, you probably, a lot of you work, have jobs, pay taxes. Your tax money goes to pay for basic research. You're the public. The public funds research. Um, and if research is not being done properly, if it's not being done ethically, then the public's tax dollars, your tax dollars, are not being well spent. So there's accountability. We got to do research in the universities and in companies uh, and in private organizations. And we have to report what our results are. We have to spend the money properly. That's accountability. And if we don't do it ethically, then we're not properly accountable to the public. That money will stop. And that's bad for everyone. It's not just bad for researchers. So many innovations and discoveries come from public funded research that we have to do it well, otherwise it dries up and then the whole nation suffers. How many people out there, you can raise your hands, think that uh, major discoveries are done entirely by one person, you know, working alone, thinking at home or working at the research bench. Okay, how many think it's done with teams? Yeah, everybody, right? Okay, so you can imagine when you wanna work with someone you're expecting them to do it properly, right? You trust them and you need trust in order for there to be collaboration for people working together. And unless we are behaving ethically, no one would, it, would trust that the people they're working with are doing it right. We, we enter into research collaborations like the one I have with Dr. Rumpf, assuming we're gonna behave fairly and ethically and treat data correctly. All that breaks down and science stops if we don't have at its foundation, trust and accountability. So I'll jump onto this one. Um, well, we kind of already said it, public accountability and encourages, encourages public support of research. So all of these things that drive our research engine and our economic prosperity in the country and our development and improvement of standard of living and all those things that are actually quite valuable really have uh, ethical conduct as a foundation. So I'm gonna ask you some more questions in a bit, but I thought I would show you this. This is from some research, you know, simple questionnaire type stuff that we've done here at UCF, where we asked students um, what they think about these questions. So this is called a Likert scale, where you have zero through four as a score, a number, if you will. And the number just correlates with these adjectives at the top. Like if you put a zero, it says, I strongly disagree with the statement. If you put a four, it means I strongly agree with the statement. And if you and neither agree nor disagree, then the score is two. So you can imagine if you combined scores from questions like this, the bigger the number, the more people really agree with the statements. So take a look at the statements and take a look at the scores that students at UCF like you gave to these statements. 
The first one, I need to understand ethics and responsible conduct of research to be successful in my graduate studies. Pretty strong agreement there, right? Ethics, number two, ethics and responsible conduct of research involve more than just following the rules of the institution. Something more than just adhering to a set of rules. Um, all the way down at the bottom, this one's pretty interesting. Number six, discussing ethics and research like we're doing here helps me understand how its practice differs across disciplines. That has a fairly high score. That's a really important thing right now because it turns out the way we do chemistry research, the way we do optics research, the way we do engineering research, the way we do biology research, slightly different across the disciplines. And yet all of the important questions that remain to be addressed are highly interdisciplinary. There's almost no simple questions left. You know, it's no longer the case in chemistry that you can just pick two chemicals off the shelf, throw them in a beaker and see what happens. Well, that's been done. Now you got to combine things to make materials that have a useful, say, optical functions to make a device and on and on. And that means most research involves multiple disciplines. In my case, I'm a chemist doing optics, working with an electrical engineer like Dr. Rumpf. Sometimes, you know, we have interest in biological uh, structures. We're doing a research project right now with a student from Dr. Rumpf's group that's related to mimicking biological structures. And we wish we had a bio collaborator on that. There's so many disciplines that come together and they each think about ethics in different ways. So understanding how ethics and practices, professional practices differ across disciplines is important. I think you guys come from different disciplines, right? Dr. Rumpf told me what's represented, but you can shout out um, who's an electrical engineer in the room. Okay, so I see two, three. Is everyone a double E or are there some other disciplines, Tip? We have one that is computer computational science. He's not here, but okay. within double E, we're kind of all over the place here. Mm -hmm. A lot of image processing. Image processing. So a lot of you, you know, will go into different fields, maybe an academic, but more than likely, most of you will end up going to work with some company. What do those companies do? They might be making circuits and chips. They might be making imaging systems. They might be trying to do uh, image and facial recognition. They might be trying to make sensors to detect chemical species, toxins, uh, biohazards. There's all kinds of things that double E's end up doing, not just playing with circuits, right? And so you're going to end up working with other disciplines and understanding how people think about ethics, responsible conduct, what you got to do is going to differ across those disciplines. Okay, so we've been saying the E word a lot and we said rules a bit. So now I throw out this question for you to answer. Just speak out. What is the difference between ethics and rules? Rules are written. Often, yeah, rules are written down. Ethics is not written down? Ethics isn't necessarily not written down. There's sometimes unspoken agreements between people. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's a really interesting point. It's hard for me to tell who said that, but kudos to you. Um, ethics, yeah, <laughs> ethics is often uh, unspoken. And so what that means is, Again, we kind of assume we're gonna behave ethically, right? We assume individuals have similar values. Does everybody have the same set of values? Do we all agree on exactly what we should do in every circumstance? No way. So right there, that's an interesting thing, right? You can have a group of you get together and form a company. Let's say you want your company to be responsible and ethical. How will it be responsible and ethical if you all have different senses of ethics or different values? That's a common case. It's not, it's not uncommon. Organizations, societies, companies are built on people who all have slightly different values. So you'll have personal values. And yet when you work in an organization, you subscribe to the organization's values, their ethical codes. And sometimes those don't perfectly align. Sometimes they can come into conflict. Sometimes you might work in a company that asks you to do something you just don't want to do. For example, uh, a student in my optics class asked me, how do I handle the following situation? I work in optics. I want to go interview with companies, but I just don't want to work, he said, in uh, military companies. I don't want to work for Lockheed Martin that makes bombs. I want to do something with optics you know, that has nothing to do with defense. How do I ask that question in an interview? Okay, so I won't tell you what the answer was or what I think he should say. Um, 
But by pointing out, he had strong personal values that he doesn't want to work with defense, right? That's fine. Other people will have very different values, but he already sees uh, a conflict and is thinking about which way his uh, profession is going. Others could have no problem working in defense, but what if the company decides to make, say, a weapon system that is not defensive, but very clearly offensive? That may have, that may create problems problems for others. Company may treat information or data in ways that you don't like. Let's say you work in a biotech company and the biotech company is not willing to reveal all of the side effects of its drug. They have to, they have to follow some rules, um, but we can always be, be very transparent or transparent enough to follow the rules. You can imagine there could be some people working there that would have personal conflict. So we have to understand that there's individual values and there's organizational values and individual values are not 100% aligned. And as people work together with slightly different viewpoints on what's right, there can be conflict or there can at least be situations that arise where those things have to be worked out. So indeed, um, ethics is not always written down. Sometimes it is though, like if you go and look at um, IEEE or SPIE, um, or some of the other professional organizations you may be affiliated with, there's usually ethics statements and codes of conduct. They're pretty interesting, um, useful to read them and see what you're signing up for when you say, I'm going to be an electrical engineer. A lot of them are very common sense, uh, but they do identify lofty goals. Okay, ethics and rule ethics are not necessarily written down. Um, we said that uh, rules are things, well, it's implied rules are things you got to follow. Ethics may kind of come from the individual or the heart in some cases. Which comes first? Do we think about a problem, discuss its ethics and make a rule? Or do we make rules and then figure out what the ethical implications are? Both was said. Yeah, it can go both ways. Can you give an example? Take take one of those and tell me how, how it could play it out that way. Prohibition? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So in the era of prohibition, a law was made against, you know, consumption, transport, or production of alcohol. Some may have viewed that as unethical. We abolished that amendment, right? So um, consuming or making alcohol is pretty much legal in most places. There are some so-called dry counties like Kentucky, where I went to high school, there's, there's counties where you can't purchase alcohol. Interestingly, in some of those same counties, you can make alcohol. So I think in the county where Maker's Mark, which is a type of whiskey is made, you can go and tour the facility, but you can't drink it. And so they bus you to another county where you can do a tasting. How's that for an interesting way to skirt the rules, right? Um, yeah, so um, you can have some rules that are uh, unethical or maybe over time we decide ah, that's, that's not a great rule, right? Just because there's a rule doesn't mean it's necessarily ethical. Okay, so that gentleman answered how it could go one way that maybe you have rules and then you refigure the ethics. Are there circumstances where it goes maybe the other way where you think about an ethical situation and then create a rule? It's a little bit more subtle. Maybe you can think of a historical example or a current example. What was that? Somebody said anything from morality. Anything from morality? Can you think of a situation Maybe a situation where evolving technology, right now, technology that's at the front frontier is causing questions of morality and what's the right thing to do. Can you think of an example, a tech example? Chimeric research. Chimeric, chimeric research? research? Yeah, I like that. You should maybe define what chimeric research means. That, that would be helpful to everyone. <laughs> Gain of function research? Um, fill that out. What is chimeric? Is that where you combine two species? Is that what that means? Genetics is the analyst and 
I guess hybrids. Oh, like human wizard kind of hybrid. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's not necessarily gotten to that kind of stage. Right now, they're just trying to grow human organs and have. Yeah, I think that's that's along the right direction. The, the theoretically ethical approach to that that kind of research, but. So I think we're going in, in a great direction. I, I think um, some of the frontier in gene editing, in biotechnology, in bioengineering are great examples where um, the technology is moving at a very rapid things that were not possible in the past and that we didn't have to think about are now possible or becoming possible and they're raising moral questions, right? Um, you know, most people are, are okay with the idea of going to the hospital and having medical technology applied. Some people are not willing to do that, right? And are saying, well, blood transfusion is unethical or against a religion, against personal values. Um, others will have no problem with some types of biotechnology. Um, you talked about um, organ harvesting, organ transplanting. I think that was one thing I heard. You know, is it ethical to generate an organ in another animal and then try kill that animal and transplant it into a human. Some would say, I oh, know that goes too far. Others would say, yeah, sure, that's okay with me. What's interesting is when you pose questions like that, people can have one answer until they need the organ, right? And then their perception can change quite a bit. Um, so our own ethics or our own personal values can really be kind of malleable. They can kind of change depending upon the circumstance that we're in. But as technology evolves, things that were impossible become possible and they really push the boundaries of what we think is moral or ethical use of technology. You know, gene editing is another. Um, it's, it seems great, I suspect to most people to use gene editing to prevent disease, but what about gene editing to change the color of an unborn's eyes? You know, let's say you want blue eyes for your child and instead of brown or green, is that ethical? What about being a little smarter or a little taller? Um, regardless of where you fall on issues like that, the technology is now emerging and making that possible. So we don't have rules for these things, right? We don't, we don't have codified rules that say what you can do with some of these technologies that are emerging. And yet there's ethical challenges embedded within them. And so the discussion, emerging discussion around these new technologies are actually pushing ethical boundaries and are forcing us to think about new rules. And I think we're going to see new rules coming out with other technologies, things like uh, artificial intelligence. We'll, we'll mention a few of those um, as we go on. But I think it does go both ways to the point of the gentleman in the far corner. You can have ethics or ethical uh, conundrums and discussions that drive new rules. You can also have rules that later turn out to have problems and can create ethical problems of their own. And then you have to change the rules. I think in our heart of hearts, we'd probably all like to have a situation where we do a full consideration of ethical impl implications and then write a perfect rule if needed. Um, but very often it's the case that something goes wrong, someone does something unethical, and then we have to make a rule. And then sometimes that rule turns out to be uh, ill-conceived and there's an ethical problem, and then we have to change it. So it goes both ways, but you can imagine where you'd prefer to be in the situation that you can good legislation or rules. You wouldn't wanna be in the situation where you write rules and then realize they're unethical. And that's where having this kind of ethical consciousness, thinking about the ideas that we're doing here is useful because at some point you're probably all gonna be you know, professionals, leaders, contributors to your discipline, contributors to the company, you're going to be setting down or helping to define rules. And so you got to be able to think in this ethical space in order to be um, a good con conversant, a good contributor to the discussions that are going to make rules and policies in whatever organization you're in. All right, so let's see. I'd written down responsible conduct of research is often discussed just in terms of the rules that we follow. Ethics, however, looks at the broader landscape. It's not just the rules we should follow, but it's also where those rules come from or contextual nature, how um, following the rules or being responsible can change depending upon our situation. 
Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about um, ethical frameworks. Some of the words that you're going to see popping up here are things you guys have already said in your answers. Um, ethical framework is really a way of framing the problem, of thinking about the, the circumstances of the problem in order to make a good decision. And there's a lot of different ethical frameworks that are out there. I'm certainly, as I already said, not an expert, but there's many ways of approaching problems. You could say, well, which should I do? Well, who's going to suffer the most? Which choice does the, the least harm? That might be something that you could say is utilitarian. Other kinds of decisions you might make would be based on following rules. Like I know it's okay to run this uh, light or to go through this stop sign without stopping because it's the middle of the night and I don't see any cars. There's no way I'm gonna hit a car. It's a stop sign, but it's 2 a.m. There's no cars. I'm just gonna go through the stop sign, right? That's an ethical decision, but it clearly breaks a rule. Some people would say that's okay. It's not about uh, following the rules. It's about making uh, a good decision based on circumstance. Others would say, no, no, you got to follow the rules because you don't know the circumstances of that intersection, right? Maybe there's a blind spot. The rule's there for a reason. That's called deontology, following the rules no matter what the rules are. Following the rules without thinking them through can get you in trouble. Even in the military, there is the principle of uh, legal order. A soldier uh, is obliged to not follow orders if the order is illegal. A commander cannot uh, instruct uh, soldiers to go and kill civilians, right? There has to be a reason to kill. There ha it has to be mission supported. There has to be harm to self or harm to uh, the military and the military uh, endeavor that justifies taking life. A soldier has the right, and in fact, the duty to speak out and question rules. So there's many different frameworks that you can think about, about what is doing right. So I want to just show a few of those. Some of those frameworks really connect to intrinsic ethical values. And you guys said some fairness. Um, we've talked about care, harming others or not harming others. That's well-being. Individual rights, respecting relationships. If you work in a research collaboration or in a company, you're expecting people to be honest, to be trustworthy. That's an inherent relationship. Um, and respecting one another in that research relationship is an ethical value. Uh, doing good, avoiding harm. Those are two different coins of the same thing, right? It's active versus passive. I, I could make a choice that does something bad and harm someone, so I might back away from that. But some would argue equally unethical is to simply do nothing when you know that a harm could occur, right? Like it's most people would agree it's not it's not a good thing to go punch them, someone, right? I mean, you learned in kindergarten, don't go hitting kids on the school ground. What about the person who stands around and watches another person bullying, right? If someone is bullying another person, do we just watch or do we intervene? Do we go get help? Do we say, hey, cut it out, quit acting that way? Um, you know, some would say it's equally unethical as throwing a punch to just stand around watching a bully. Okay, so there's doing harm and also avoiding harm. Uh, another value is respecting uh, autonomy. That's a big issue right now, right? Uh, if you think about COVID, if we think about um, vaccines and vaccine mandates, um, a lot of people are pushing back and saying, I have a right to control my own body. I should have autonomy. And there's, there's strong arguments to be made there. Um, there's also these hard to understand issues or hard to characterize issues of purity or sanctity. Um, you know, some would say, don't modify animals, don't do genetic modification because it's, what does that, what does that really mean? Um, you know, somehow I think a lot of us could have a queasy feeling in our stomach if we saw a frog with three eyes, right? Which by the way, that's been done genetically already. Why do we have that kind of odd feeling in, uh, about a modification or use of technology that creates something that's not in the natural world, kind of gets to this sense of purity or what's right, normality. Um, and, and that's a big argument that's often advanced in this ethical framework. A lot of these things are personal values. They connect to individual personal values, but some of these really connect to societal values or even professional values. Like when we talked about respect in relationships, 
I define that in terms of a research relationship in a company, but there's so many other relationships you can have, right? Like a marriage um, or, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, there's expectations of trust and fairness in that kind of relationship. So these, these are frameworks related to ethical values, but there's more. There's also these things called epistemic values. Who, who's heard the word um, epistemology? Yeah, okay, far back corner. Um, what's your definition of epistemology? We can't define it is what we're getting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the word as I know it means really, it connects to knowledge or study of knowledge. Um, you know, how do you know what you know? How do you know what is a fact? How do you know what is information or knowledge? Um, and so we can talk about how we know things. We can talk about the value of knowing things, the intrinsic value of information. Um, we have personal value, but the things that we create have value. And likewise, I think all of you as engineers can recognize there's real value and indeed beauty in, in scientific knowledge, right? You, you probably have all done like Euler's relationship where you can you know, represent a, a complex exponential as a sine and a cosine and relate uh, real numbers to imaginaries and such. Um, Euler's e equation to me is just gorgeous. I think it's so neat. You've got this one equation that has some of the most fundamental constants and concepts in science. Zero is in there, one is in there, E is in there, pi is in there. It's an amazing equation. There's something beautiful about that knowledge that's there. It has value just as a knowable thing. Um, and so some people will frame and think about what is right or what is not right, not just in terms of the ethical values in A, but in terms of knowledge values. Like it's worth doing something um, because you learn something or you generate predictive power or um, evidence and data and information you collect in research has greater value if it's robust, if it's very trustworthy, right? Anyone can run an experiment. Someone who runs an experiment that has tight error bars and really good uh, quality, high quality of information and can be said to have higher um, epistemic value. There's completeness, the idea of full understanding, objectivity, truth, beauty, all of those things kind of connect to epistemology. Okay, there's also value systems that connect directly to responsible conduct of research. And you've already learned some of those things like FFP, which is uh, plagiarism, falsification, and fabrication. You know, those are just things you don't do, right? Um, and, and some will think about ethics or ethical values just within the confines of these responsible conduct principles. Others relate to how we acquire or manage data. Um, that's a big thing in terms of the federal agencies that fund research and their mandate. When they give money to researchers to do work, there comes with that an expectation that we will collect our data, handle it properly, and then not just keep it to ourselves, right? The knowledge we collect it may have an epistemic value for us as researchers, but NSF and NIH and these other agencies say, no, no, that's not enough. You got to share it. You got to publish. You got to disseminate your information so other people can benefit from it. Also in this RCR value stuff, there's things like authorship, doing it properly, peer review. That's how we validate that information we put out in the literature is at some level correct um, or robust. Other people review it in a blind review process, think deeply about it and say, hey, this is pretty good, but have you thought about X, Y, Z? Or maybe I think you need to do more research or maybe this needs to be described better. And that feedback enables authors to make more uh, better claims, better statements of what their uh, research is, but it also acts as a vetting procedure to make sure that what gets out into the literature is more truth than fake news, right? That's, that's a big part of how we do research. Um, another one that should be important to you guys is the mentor-trainee relationship. Each, each of you has a teacher, right? That's <laughs> Dr. Rumpf. You may be doing research uh, and there, you, thereby you have a research mentor, or maybe you're going to go into graduate school and continue training and have a research mentor. When you sign up for that as a student, you're expecting that the mentor, or the teacher, instructor is going to treat you fairly, right? Um, is going to solve problems that may come up or resolve them in ways that are fair. Like when you get sick, 
the expectation is I'll be able to make up the exam, you know, as long as I can show I was really sick. You expect to be accommodated. All kinds of things built in there um, are intrinsic values associated with the, the mentor-mentee uh, relationship. And then in certain types of research, there's animals involved or humans that are involved. So there's review processes to make sure that research is done properly to maintain animal welfare and uh, welfare of humans. And then D, let's see if I click over here, we're almost done with this. There's aesthetic values, just, uh, you know, kind of connects a little bit to epistemic values, but um, things that are, that have beauty or simplicity or order um, are said to have value that can maybe make us choose one option versus another. And then there's real economic value, right? All these things connect to economic value. Um, companies aren't going to be able to run um, and make new products unless their research is good, unless workers, researchers, uh, team members are working together ethically. Um, and, and really breaks down. All of our economic prosperity um, goes down the tubes if we don't have trust relationships. And that really comes down to ethics. So these ideas of values and ethical values, they play a role at many different levels, personal, societal, and professional. And there's a lot of different ways that we can frame these issues and decide you know, what's worth doing or what's not worth doing, whether it connects to ethical values or knowledge values or values that we hold in research or organizational values or values that uh, are derived from economic benefit, sales, um, generation of revenue, return, of value to customers, to the public who funds research uh, or investors in a company. Okay, so now I'm gonna be quiet for a little bit, another Q&A session, and I'm gonna be mindful of the time. Dr. Rumpf will help, uh, help me stay on time and give me a 15 minute warning, but we're doing pretty well here. What we wanna now know is, uh, can we have a complete set of rules? Let's discuss that. The straightforward answer should be no, because I think we've already discussed that you have to like go back and forth between ethics and rulemaking and always adjust and always modify. So I don't think there are a complete set of rules. I think we're yeah. in pretty good agreement. No complete set of rules. But is that just because we don't have it? or we can't create it. You know, we could say, well, we haven't sat down and come up with all the rules to govern this process or how we do research, or is it impossible to have a complete set of rules? We may be able to have a complete set of rules for this point in time, exactly now, but we need to be uh, open to modifying those rules. So we can't say these are the final set of rules. I don't know. That yeah, I think that's a fair point. It's it's obviously impractical, right? Who wants to sit down and enumerate all the possible circumstances in which you could do something wrong to go and make a rule, right? We'd like to believe we can have a reasonable finite set of rules that help govern and ensure people are doing the right thing in different circumstances. And by rules, of course, I'm thinking very broadly, not just legislation at the state or federal level, but also policies within a university or rules within the Raytheons and the Lockheed Martins of the world, the companies you may work for, rules within professional organizations like IEEE. Um, you know, if you really are a, a, a bad engineer, you can be thrown out of an engineering society. You can be a lawyer who misbehaves and then you're disbarred. You lose the right to practice law and no one will pay for your services, right? Or it's much, much less likely you'd ever be hired if you are a disbarred lawyer or if you're an architect who doesn't have a certification or if you're an engineer who doesn't who's no longer affiliated with a professional organization, right? We lose our credibility. Um, so it's pretty hard to imagine we could have a perfectly complete set of rules. It's in, but maybe we could sit down and write them at a given time. I really liked what you said there. You said we, maybe we could have a complete set of rules at a given time. So let's go back to what you, what you were saying there. What were you thinking? What's the, what's the significance of time there? Time basically signifies change, right? So uh, as we go forward, we're gonna have more things that we can't really think of right now. If you go, as, as you mentioned with uh, the comments about gene editing and all those sort of things, we couldn't kind of imagine those, let's say a couple of decades ago. 
So time signifies change. And whenever something yeah. changes, we need to look at the rule book and then see if uh, we need to make changes. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was very well said. <clears throat> and I think there's an important distinction to be made. The, the, the claim is not that we should have rules now and later society changes its mind and then we'll just change our rules. And maybe later we'll come back to the old rules that we had. I don't mean to imply that maybe just with time, our sense of ethics is highly variable and it wiggles back and forth. That's not productive. Presumably what we should do, uh, our ethical conduct, what is right uh, is in pursuit of a broader universal truth we can all agree upon. What I mean about rules changing, and to your point, I think, is that technology changes, right? And so we can't necessarily anticipate outcomes or possibilities um, as new technologies emerge, and those can create new moral challenges. And what's, what's so exciting to me about this idea is you guys are those agents of change. You guys are the ones who are learning electrical engineering or your profession. You're going into companies. You're going to be inventors, producers, developers, thinkers. You're going to end up driving the change in rules because you're going to create new possibilities that demand new rules or at least demand people who think ethically such that they would make good choices as new technologies emerge. So I don't think we can have a complete set of rules. And I think you're right with your thinking, but ethics potentially can help us understand the rule sets we have, can help us make good decisions when there are no rules. Can you think of a case even now, not talking now about technology pushing for new rules, I'm just thinking about right now in your everyday work, can you think of an example where there's not necessarily a rule, but ethics or your own values can cause you to maybe make a good decision in the absence of that rule. Can you think of an example? Somebody has something in mind. This is a tough question. This one's not easy. All right, maybe we're stumped. I'm not seeing any volunteers for that one. How many of you are, how many of you are doing research? Yeah, one or two. Oh, a bunch. Pretty much, pretty much everybody, yeah. Oh. Okay, well, you know what I think about when I do <laughs> research, right? I'm running a research group, but every once in a while I do an experiment. I've done experiments myself as an undergrad and a grad student. What I, what I think about here is when you're at the bench, when you're working with your oscilloscope, when you're working on your circuit, when you're collecting your data, there's no set of rules that you constantly go back and forth to and consult in how to treat those data, right? Nobody's necessarily looking over your shoulder at all instances telling you whether to write down all the numbers you kind of make some choices on the fly. You may decide, hmm, this doesn't look experiment. Let me collect that again. You may say, redo it. You're making decisions on the fly where there's not a strict set of rules. You know, you're not a computer. There's no computer program that guides you. So you're having to think ethically and say, well, what's the right thing to do here? Um, and so at the kind of microscopic, Topic level where you do your research or do your work, I think you make ethical decisions, hopefully, or you think in terms of, you do you make decisions that hopefully have ethical outcomes all the time, even in the absence of a rule. Rules tend to handle kind of broader situations, but the microscopic decisions that we make when we're doing our work are hopefully professional, and hopefully they're living up to the ethical standards of our professions, right? They're aspirant, we would say, they are, the rules often uh, establish kind of a minimum baseline of how we should be behaving. And hopefully you're operating above that, right? Reaching for an ethical standard that's high or even above the minimum limit of the rules. So I, I, I think basically everyone is kind of functioning as their own little ethicist when they do day-to-day -day activities. And it's important then for scientists and engineers to really understand how ethics and moral decision-making really just percolates and permeates into absolutely everything that you do. So I wanna show, um, oh, last point, and this one's important. This one's really important. To be real professionals, I think you need to develop an ethical consciousness. You know, you might be thinking as a student, the way I become a professional is get an engineering degree. 
Okay, and so to do that, I enroll at UTEP and I take Dr. Rump's course and I you know, do a couple of things here and then I get my degree. But if someone gives you a piece of paper that says you're an engineer, does that really make you a professional? You can maybe say, well, no, it's not just when I get that piece of paper. It's when I get my big job, right? When I get my first job. Is that what really makes you a professional? Maybe it's when working in that company, you help develop a product that sells well or that is high performance. You know, at which step do you become a professional? And I would say the answer is none of those. I would say you become a professional when you start acting like it. All those little steps that I mentioned, like enrolling, getting a degree, getting your first job, those are just you climbing a ladder toward greater and greater success. But you shouldn't wait for someone to anoint you and say, ah, you're a professional engineer. You are effectively becoming a professional when you act like it, when you take ownership of your actions and say, this is what engineers do. I'm going to start behaving like an engineer. And part of that, of being a real professional, is really having an ethical consciousness, thinking and engaging with me on these topics and others, and understanding you know, that being a good engineer, being a good scientist, is really about having ethics as your foundation. That's really a first step. Okay, so there's a, there's a couple of views of ethics and uh, research uh, responsible conduct that I just wanted to, to point out. One of those is kind of compliance driven. And compliance is, you know, following the rules. They're important. They're driven by institutions, by companies. They tend to be top down. Everybody should follow these rules, right? Um, it doesn't necessarily build community, right? And sometimes it even builds fear. Oh, I got to follow these rules or I'll be punished or I'll be fired. Um, doesn't necessarily give people a sense of, yeah, I'm part of a team that's doing something significant. The other approach is really ethical consciousness, what we're doing today. I mean, this is really where our focus is. This is about understanding the rules. This is about knowing how to make good decisions, even when there are no rules. This is about having frameworks that can help you think about the results of your decisions so that you do things that maybe generate value, decrease harm, um, meet expectations of your organization or your group. The idea of thinking about ethics is the reverse of compliance because it's very bottom up. If everyone, this is hypothetical, right? But if everyone behaved ethically, we wouldn't need rules. It's because sometimes people make bad decisions or they don't think about implications downstream of their decisions. Often over time, time came up in our discussion. Sometimes people don't think about time as an effect. If I do this now, what will be the effect three months, six months, or a year down the road? Chemists, like me as a profession, we're guilty of that. Nobody thought about plastics. Nobody thought about microplastics and their harm. Nobody thought about bisphenol A and how it can uh, be an endocrine mimic that causes developmental issues in organisms. We just made plastics and sold a hell of a lot of it. Now we have an environmental problem, right? Um, nanoscience at some level may be having some of those issues. Use of fossil fuels and how it drives climate is uh, change is a problem. People haven't thought about the long-term implications down the road of, of their actions. Ethics gives us a framework for hopefully doing that better. And it's bottom-up thinking. Everyone tries to be an ethical actor. Um, and if we are part of that, it can actually build a lot of community, right? We may not all agree perfectly, but if we're thinking ethically about our individual values, it can help and create um, an ethical organization. I like the vector model, right? That's why I'm using my fingers here. You might have values that point this way. I might have values that point that way, but our vectors can add up to an institutional norm, right? That's the superposition of those vectors that has high magnitude and points in the right direction. So in some ways, be an ethical vector, and then you'll have um, good outcomes for your institution. So Focus on uh, responsible conduct and ethics is, is really growing. If you think about it, it's out there in society. So think about the Me Too movement. Think about Time's Up. At UCF, we have this thing called Let's Be Clear campaign. So that doesn't apply to you, but it's about whistleblowing and stuff. A lot of this is about um, choosing whether you're just going to be reactive or proactive. Can someone distinguish between those two for us? What does it mean to be reactive versus proactive? Oh, that's an yeah. easy one. Right. Reactive is doing something in response to something after the fact. Proactive is kind of uh, 
by uh, expecting that that might happen and then acting accordingly. Yeah, that's that's great. And then for someone else, what would we rather do, you know, as individuals or society? Would we rather be reactive or proactive? And why? <laughs> People are reactive, to be honest. Uh, yeah, that's why we kind of we're having this discussion that oh, we should be proactive. Yeah, very be often we're yeah, that's good. I heard a lot of that. Very often we're reactive. Something goes wrong and then we have to make a rule. Or we got to clean up the, you know, the contamination or we got to change our use of plastics. Really, we'd prefer to be proactive. That would benefit us more. This might be a problem. Let's solve it now before it becomes a big problem. Um, it's very easy to be reactive rather than proactive in your own work. Like, let's say you're doing research and you realize, oh, I did something wrong. I didn't measure those things properly. I've spent a week on this. They've paid me. I've been working on this for a week and I didn't do it right. That is an opportunity to be proactive rather than reactive. A tendency is to say, hmm, I'm not going to tell anyone. That's a big problem. You need to tell people when something goes wrong, right? You may take a hit. God, you wasted a week of time. All right, we'll sort it out. That's being proactive. You take your hit rather than hiding it. If you hide it, and it comes out later, you didn't tell people the results were wrong. Now you look like someone who tried to cover up the issue, right? Much, much better to be proactive than reactive. And that, that happens for individuals. When you make a mistake, own up to it, get on with it. Um, but it also happens with big organizations, right? With whole professions. Um, and a lot of ethics is about learning to be proactive rather than reactive. And this model that we're talking about, about ethics and responsible conduct, is about pushing toward proactive rather than reactive behavior. And it happens in so many ways. It happens in terms of uh, embedded ethics, where we try to, to do things um, that, uh, you know, that, that reach ethical outcomes, but it also has to do with what some people call broader impacts, like not just what happens to me as an individual, what's right for me, but how does it affect others? What's the downstream impact on my company or the people we serve or those who use our products? And, and what's the responsible way to behave? So all of those things kind of come together when we start thinking about ethics and responsible conduct. So I've got some examples here um, that I think connect directly to engineers. These are examples where in professional practice, people didn't do what was right or didn't listen to those who were saying, I, I think I'd like to be proactive here. We need to change our direction. Um, and so I think some of these are probably familiar to you, but I'll, I'll run through them. The Mars Climate Orbiter was, you know, a multi hundred million dollar mission, you know, half a billion dollars on that order to send a robotic probe to Mars uh, in order to study the climate of Mars and pave the way for future missions. And the orbiter just shot right past Mars. It failed to achieve uh, orbital insertion. Does anybody know why that happened? Has anyone heard this story? Do they know why it happened? Yeah. Tip, you'll have to translate. The, our guess was the, uh, the units problem. Yeah, that's the units problem. Okay, you've heard it. That's right. So, you know, within the industry, the company that was providing, um, you know, information on the thrust that was realigning uh, the vehicle as it prepared for orbital insertion was specifying thrust in something like foot pounds or I don't know what, whereas the folks at Caltech were working in SI units. They were expecting newtons of force. And so they just took the numbers at face value. There was not good enough communication between them. Um, you know, when you think about your classes, how often are your professors saying, use SI units, give errors, give uncertainty, properly uh, treat your data, don't round until the end, all that stupid stuff, or it might feel stupid, directly impacted the outcome of this mission because people were not properly communicating their units and their work. It's, it's high time for US industry to start using SI units. Still, we use Imperial units. We're like one of the only countries still hanging out not accepting the metric system. And it cost us dearly in this situation. Okay, another one is this one that you see at the right with this um, GIF, with this wiggly bridge. 
This is such an amazing story. How many of you guys have seen this picture before? Yeah. Okay. How many of you, how many of you, yeah, a bunch. How many of you know what a resonant mode is? Yeah. Everybody in engineering has heard of that, right? Um, you know, it could be circuit, could be an RLC circuit that's oscillating uh, in something mechanical like this bridge. It's just the natural frequency at which it wants to vibrate. In the work with that we do with Dr. Rumpf, um, you know, it might be the oscillation of an electromagnetic wave. All kinds of systems have these resonant modes. These guys built this bridge and didn't properly test and model the structural reinforcements when the winds came up high. And uh, I think it was in fall, the November winds got very high up to about 42 miles per hour and started to create a vibration. And this bridge was not sufficiently reinforced to damp out those vibrations. So the amplitude just continued to grow and it went into a natural oscillation. This lasted about a half an hour. <laughs> this bridge did not last that long. I mean, I, to me, I think this is just such an amazing picture. Can you see concrete bending like that? Not forever, right? This bridge collapsed and it was rebuilt with a truss rather than vertical I-beams underneath that were stiffer that helped to suppress. And um, this is a classic example in engineering. Another one is the Challenger disaster. Um, so does anyone know why Challenger failed? O-rings. O-rings, that's right, O-rings. And so you had the engines underneath the shuttle and then on the sides, the solid rocket boosters, the solid rocket boosters were sections of uh, solid combustible fuel that were pieced together and where they're assembled to make one long SRB rocket, there were these O-rings that fitted a seal so that the hot gases burning inside the SRB would not escape. The seals had a, had a thing called a J-seal which had a putty that would actually form a good seal between the mechanical joints. And this putty did not stay compliant at low temperature. So when Challenger was launched, the weather was very cold outside. The putty was now kind of hard and rigid and it contracted. So when the rocket took off, hot gases generated inside the SRB escaped out the J seal and jetted unfortunately, right onto the side of the, the hydrogen tank and caused an explosion just over two minutes into the flight. The thing is, engineers knew about this. Engineers had actually reported, we can't launch in cold temperature. This is a problem. Engineers had actually reported when Challenger came to the pad for this particular launch, it's too cold to launch. But tight schedules, concern about uh, funding, concern about potentially losing funding if they didn't keep to a launch schedule, pushed them to launch anyway with disastrous consequences. Another one is Hubble Space Telescope. Um, so this one's quite remarkable because it's close to our field of optics. The Hubble Telescope had a primary reflector which had to have a very accurate curvature in order to reflect rays to form a focus that would give nice sharp images. And so when telescopes are built, pains are taken to measure the surface of the telescope and make sure it has the right shape to get that sharp focus. As Hubble was being built, new technologies were coming online in order to measure curvatures of optics. And rather than using an, a method of interferometry with a incoherent source, lasers were becoming so much more commonplace that a new laser interferometer system was adopted for the measurement. So when they put this apparatus on for the first time to study Hubble, it required some little uh, washers to affix it. The washers were painted. The paint added about 100 microns of extra thickness, and that threw off the position of the measurement tool relative to the mirror. So it gave a measurement that said the mirror is correctly polished. But it turns out the old technology, the old interferometer system that had been used in the past was also used, and it gave an answer that said, nope, the mirror is not polished right. It's incorrect. So the point is, a new approach was used, ostensibly an approach that should have given or was expected to give in more accurate data. But when they mechanically attached it, this extra spacer threw off the measurement. They had two measurements, and they disagreed. You guys know repeated measurements ought to agree. 
measurements of different techniques should agree. They may have different uncertainties, right? You may have systematic errors in there, but in general, two approaches for measuring things ought to agree. If you use a yardstick and a tape measure, and one of them tells you it's one foot and the other tells you it's one foot and one inch, there's something wrong, right? How do you resolve that? You need to stop and think and figure out what the problem is. In this case, they said, oh, well, lasers, this has got to be more accurate. Let's just forget about the old method. They didn't pay attention to what had been a tried and true measurement. And it wasn't until Hubble got up into space that they realized, ah, it's blurry. It's nearsighted. We're getting images like the one on the left. So they had to develop a corrector and use a very dangerous uh, additional mission with a very dangerous and long extravehicular uh, spacewalk in order to go and fix it. And they managed to do it. And it's quite remarkable that they fixed it, but it was unnecessary because the information was known that it was off. So there's examples like this where um, communication broke down, where ego got in the way, where managers didn't trust engineers reporting, where um, information was overlooked. All of those represent failures in ethical conduct, right? Okay, so wrapping up here, um, there's lots of examples, I think, where ethics is important to science and engineering. And what we were looking at in the previous slide was, I think, examples where uh, personal behavior could have prevented bad outcomes at the professional level, right? And where personal ethics can benefit professional ethics, and yet it failed. There's also societal impacts, right? You've got a, and, got a 14 minute warning, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, that's perfect, I really appreciate it. Okay. And we've already touched on some of these, right? We talked about uh, things like, like gene editing. So I throw up some others where technology is advancing, creating moral challenges or challenges to what we think is ethical. And these have huge societal implications. So in addition to gene editing, there's also artificial intelligence, um, there's vaccinations, right? Vaccination technology and the COVID challenge that we're in. There's also uh, climate change. And I want to stop here, answer my question at the bottom. Can you guys think of others where ethics is important in technology and having societal impacts? Where is ethics an issue today? We'll stick to science because we're scientists. Lots of other stuff. Yeah. Drones and privacy was one. Wow. Yeah, that's a great one. Drones, um, so much more information you can get with drones. Uh, but what happens with uh, privacy and collection of those data? Excellent. What else on drones? Did you hear that one, Steve? I did not. About, about satellites being overhead and collecting intelligence and signals from the people. Right. Yeah. All, all well and good if the information is being used by the right people with no nefarious purposes. Right. Um, yeah. But humans are not perfect. That's for sure. Um, so our whole society is kind of built on privacy and privacy rights. Uh, but the need for information, the need to protect anti-terrorism efforts, the need to, um, you know, combat climate change um, requires more information, more satellites. And then how do we use that information? Even things like um, self-driving vehicles. The safest paradigm for self-driving vehicles is one where a vehicle knows where other cars are, right? And there's actually Ford and um, Mercedes-Benz and another auto manufacturer are trying to develop standards. Think of it as uh, the portable document format, the PDF of uh, self-driving technologies where cars will share information. So a car can know whether to slow down and stop because other cars are coming to the intersection. But that means now that you traveling in your car has to be known to everyone else. Where are you going? When did you get there? How far did you travel? How long did you operate your car? You know, um, information can be used against us. And so people are kind of concerned about that. Um, that's in the artificial intelligence space. On drones, I was thinking drone warfare, right? Um, it's possible now, it's becoming increasingly possible and there are weapon systems being developed um, where the kill order and the kill decision is made by the software. 
any others that you can think about where uh, ethics and technology intersect? I'll let, I'll let you ponder that. Any Your others? Only? Is that like interfacing oh. the brain and electronics? Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Some may push back on that and say, no, no, don't do that on that issue of sanctity. Remember I talked about sanctity, what's inhuman or dehumanizing. Um, the older I get, the more I think I would like to have that. Man, it's hard for me to access all the information that I need. Um, could be very efficient, but it might be a two-way link, right? Could our, could our own thoughts, our own personal data uh, be stolen in that way? A lot of people are concerned about that. Not Elon Musk, he loves it, but you know. The question I, I would have in that kind of technology is, do you become the machine? you become the thing that you created? Hold that thought. I'm wrapping up here, um, but I'm gonna come to that very point. So here's my ABCs, how to stay on the ethical side. Okay, this is very contrived and kind of uh, cheesy, uh, but I think it's useful. Um, I worked real hard to try to come up with words here that match the letters ABC. The first thing is ask. In your professional practice, if you're not sure what to do, reach out now. That's hard, especially for students or newbies in a company, because you want to look good, right? You want to look like you know the answers and can solve problems. But if you take action without knowing all the facts or the information you need, then you screw up. And so you got to be willing to push your ego aside and ask the right questions, right? People than you might think. Uh, be willing to be known as the person who asks questions and doesn't know everything. It's much better than being known as the person who didn't ask the right questions and made bad decisions. B is for be aware. Um, you got to know the rules, right? You got to do your homework. It's not enough to just say, oh, I didn't know that was wrong. You got to pay attention to your organization's rules and then think ethically about what to do. Um, asking if you're not really sure, even within the rules, what to do. C is communicate. Tell people what you're doing. Um, let partners in professional organizations and in collaborations and in partnerships know what's going on. One day, you guys are going to be leaders, right? You may start with a company, but you're going to become managers or leaders of team. You're going to go places. And then you'll be in charge. you got to communicate what you're are to your employees and the team members whom you lead. Um, be transparent. D is for disclose. Um, when you make a decision, tell others. When you decide, hey, I'm going to throw out this data set because I think it's spurious or it has systematic error or there's electronic noise, doing that. Um, when you make big changes in agreed upon directions for your organization or your research team, uh, let others know. And then E is for events. That means generate evidence, document what you're doing. Part of good professionalism is just keeping track of what you're doing. I kind of did this naturally because my memory is not great. So I have a Word doc with notes for all my projects and have meetings. I put the date in important stuff we talked about. Sometimes it's just like an email address or the people who were there. Oh, I remember this meeting we had a month ago. There was some guy from Air Force. I can't remember his name. Let me go check my notes doc. It helps my own memory. It helps me be a little more professional, but it's also useful because sometimes I can refer to it and say, oh, I think we talked about that already. Remember we decided I have it here in my notes. Um, documenting what you're doing is good for your own professional practice, but it's also something that you can do to show others that you tried to be ethical or that you thought about something or you uh, made a decision based on these uh, known parameters and that you told others, right, that you already disclosed. Keep track of what you're doing. Take good notes, that sort of thing. All right. So we've talked about a whole bunch of stuff. I hope you guys found it interesting. Um, one of the projects that I'm doing is with this uh, UCF Center for Ethics. So we're, we've got some research projects, one funded by NSF, where we're trying to uh, study ethics and ethics education and stuff. But there's some interesting things, I think, that we're trying to do. And I want you to think about visiting the Ethics Center. You can just type in UCF uh, Ethics uh, or Ethics Center in Google and it will pop up. But one of the things that we've been doing is recording workshops like this. Um, we've been recording uh, presentations from outside speakers. So if you type uh, YouTube, UCF Center for Ethics, you'll get a page that looks like this with videos that you can go and watch from uh, a number of different things. I'm gonna tell you about one of those right here. I started a uh, speaker series this semester called Ethically Speaking, an interdisciplinary speaker series on contemporary moral issues. Here's the first three talks, more are coming. Uh, the first two have happened. 
and there's recordings available now for the first one. The second recording is almost done. This third talk is coming out. Check out the topics. One is on artificial life, okay, which I think someone posed a question about that. This guy, Michael Levin, has shown with others ways that you can modify organisms and create completely new organisms. And he's actually questioning or asking us to think about how do we classify what is living, what has autonomy, what is not living. You know, when we get to the point where we can put a chip in the brain, add mechanical constructs, are you a machine? Are you a human? Are you a cyborg? What do these terms mean? And um, he's saying that we need to think about those things because it is natural, he argues, for us to try to modify and enhance ourselves as individuals and as a species. And so we're gonna have to address these questions. And he's done some really amazing experiments at a very primitive level, but on flatworms and other organisms where he creates things that don't exist, that have not existed naturally. And interestingly, which, which reproduce. So you can make a modification and that organism continues to reproduce with that modification. It's a new organism, he would argue. Um, you can see what you think, but you can see this uh, presentation, the recording, if you just go to, well, you can either visit our website at Ethically Speaking, or you can go to the YouTube playlist and you'll find uh, Dr. Michael Levin's presentation on synthetic living organisms right here. That's probably one of the best well-spent hours I think you'll ever make. Um, we have a on quantification in ethics. Think about that. Coming up with a number that says what is ethical or what isn't. This mathematician says, may sound stupid, but we do it all the time. Like when we decide how to spend funds for um, uh, federal projects, when we award uh, damages in a court case, when we uh, pay out an insurance claim, right? When someone dies and they're paid life insurance based on quality adjusted years of life, we effectively quantify values and ethics. So I think it's going to be kind of a interesting. I'm looking forward to what this guy has to say. We also have, and this is almost the last slide, a Be Better Club. This is a place where students just like you can come together and have informal discussions like this. They happen bi-weekly and we just explore topics in ethics. You can propose a topic. Sometimes we have planned topics. And so on the image here, you can see some of the students. Um, three of these are students from my optics class, Nick here and the two Austins. Believe it or not, these guys are roommates, both named Austin. Um, they come to the Be Better Club. Um, and we've had topics related to artificial intelligence, to COVID, to um, data mining and all kinds of things. So this, if you're interested in this, just shoot me an email. You, you'll have my contact information and I can get you signed up, but it's a place to just informally talk about ethics with no right or wrong answers. So that's kind of the end. I really appreciate you guys listening. I especially appreciate your engaging and sharing your thoughts and thinking about these things. Um, if I didn't screw up too bad, Tip might have me back next week and we'll talk about some case studies and do some more discussion. Um, but um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I got my email address there and you can find me on the web. Um, and thank you for all your, fe your feedback and engagement. I really appreciate it. Awesome, thank you. Thanks guys.